You're listening to the Retro Hour, episode 23, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Dan Wood. And we've got some amazing guests this week, Dan. Yeah, now if you're new to the show, the way it works is we come out every single Friday, available from our website, theretrohour.com. Ravi and I recap the big retro stories of the week, and then we hand over to a special guest. And this guy, Barry Leach, is just uh, an amazing musician, to the point that Rihanna's nicking his tunes at the moment. You know, <laughs> That is crazy. Now, uh, this is something that's been going on in pop music quite a lot over the last couple of years. Like certain producers have been kind of stealing samples from old, uh, you know, 8 and 16-bit computer games. Yeah, so we're going to have a little comparison with one of Barry's tunes. And uh, he's also doing some stuff at the Skywalker Ranch at the moment. That's so. crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you know, for, um, I know we have a lot of old Amiga heads listen to our show. He's a guy that did Lotus Turbo Challenge 2, the music on that at the beginning. The one that Just an anthem. Oh, an absolute dude. banger. Probably my favourite all-time Amiga mod, Lotus 2 intro. Yeah, definitely. So uh, Barry's going to be on in the next half an hour. We'll chat to him all about music, all his memories, and find out what he's up to these days coming up in just a bit on the Retro Hour. Before that, though, straight into this week's stories. And uh, this is always kind of cool when you see video games getting made into real-life objects. Yeah, and I, I'm really surprised this hasn't been done before. It's a giant Pong table, <laughs> and they've kind of automated it. So it looks like it's on, you know, kind of typewriter heads. Yeah. And they're moving up and down. And it's it's like 3D. He's literally added blocks onto it and magnets. And, you know, you can fire the ball across. It's quite good. And the ball itself, is a ball reel or is that just... Uh, yeah, it is, isn't it? Is, or is yeah. that like a block on the screen? I can't really tell from the video, actually. Um, it's a magnet. It's, it's, it? it's on a sheet of glass. That is crazy. Underneath, it's all magnetic. And then the kind of stuff's flying around, you know, <laughs> on the sheet of glass. It's a real nicely done machine. And then there's a display at the top that keeps tally of the score as well. And it, it looks, I mean, pretty much what it is, real life Pong. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'd love to have one of these or, or kind of recreate another game in real life. Imagine real life Snake, <laughs> where it just gets bigger and starts <laughs> growing out the floor. A few more wires for that one, wouldn't they? But yeah. just imagine this being like a cafe or a, like a trendy bar or something. That would be awesome. Yeah, that would be cool. Even to serve drinks, you could fire it across and choose who gets a drink. <laughs> <laughs> a magnet on the bottom of the glass. But it's uh, an article on The Nerdist, if you want to check this out. Uh, a really cool YouTube video. It shows the whole creation progress and everything and how he's done it. So uh, we'll pop a link in the show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, this next story. I'm not sure whether to be impressed by this or terrified. Yeah, um, this is very interesting. They've found out that the uh, US nuclear arsenal is controlled by 1970s 8-inch floppy disks as well. So they've probably got disk rot already. Oh, my word. So uh, essentially what this is, I mean, I, I've watched a, a news report of this today, actually, and they show some of the old um, nuclear silos, of which there are still, I think it's like over a 1,000 all across America still. Mm. And this reporter went along and... First of all, they got there and the door didn't work, so it was propped open with just like a door prop, <laughs> like a so, stick. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was honestly. So wow. you could just walk into like this nuclear missile silo, <laughs> and then they show a close-up of the machines. Now, as you said, these are computers from the early 1970s that still use eight-inch floppies. You know, the massive ones, like yeah. on the movie War Games. Well, hopefully they're not connected to the internet. I guess they'd be standalone machines. So I, I suppose if if the floppies still hold the data. Yeah. <laughs> well, a lot of people have been using your argument saying that, you know, these machines are not as susceptible as hacking, you know, as like something modern would be. And <laughs> another guy posted like a comment saying, would you really want a Windows 10 update in the middle of the uh, the missile launch sequence? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, I mean, to be fair, they probably are quite simplistic machines. All we've got to do is, you know, have a launch code. They must be connected to the outside world somehow, though, to get the launch orders. Oh, one, one strange thing was that I always used to... Um hear this quote about the PlayStation 2, mm -hmm. that it was powerful enough to run a nuclear sub. That was always the kind of line that okay. they had to chuck out there. <laughs> By the sounds of it, a ZX81 would be. <laughs> yeah, like a 70s computer can run it, anything. <laughs> Early Pong machine. <laughs> what if these guys like watch the War Games movie and be like, one day we'll have technology like that in here? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's probably, you know, kids that have grown up and never seen a floppy disk, yet this media is deciding their future. That's crazy, <laughs> That's isn't the it? Of it? Well, I mean, now that we're 
were kind of, you know, the, the Cold War's long over and all that, I guess, you know, a lot of these are probably just there as a, a deterrent, really, these days. I mean, they don't expect to use them, but it says here, though, um, shockingly, the US Government Accountability Office admitted replacement parts for these systems are increasingly difficult to find now that they're obsolete. <laughs> I did actually read a story that NASA have got some, like, really old systems as well, and they've resorted to buying bits for it off eBay. Yeah, well, yeah. NASA for a long time actually used Amigas. Yeah. They used them for their uh, planet scanning, mm-hmm. so they'd have machines on for 10 years and they'd be like you know working out the surface of the planets um but the nasa officials didn't like amiga so yeah. they said you have to move on to other stuff even though the engineers fought it well there is a video on youtube i think isn't there of an interview with these guys from nasa yeah back then so uh, if you're interested in that that is a really good uh, little insight into the the workings of nasa back in the early 90s but i think you know there probably are these ancient machines all around the world in the most bizarre uses you mentioned the amiga there actually a guy commented on one of my youtube videos saying that he works in a nuclear power station and there's an amiga 600 doing some of the monitoring apparently <laughs> God. <laughs> so but, yeah, I'd be amazed at how many of these old systems are everywhere, you know. Yeah. Well, it's and, like, if it's not broke, why fix it, I guess? Well, well, they're also quite beautiful, and that uh, leads us on to our next piece, which is about computers being used in design and photography. And this guy's basically gone to the old Bletchley Park Museum mm-hmm. and took a picture, took amazingly beautifully framed pictures of these old machines like you know, designs from Alan Turing and stuff, Mm -hmm. uh, 1950s machines and uh, machines that predate punch cards. Yeah. And they look like something out of Buck Rogers. They do. They're (laughs) awesome. There's one here, the ICL 7500, a terminal for a mainframe from the 1970s. It's so Star Trek, isn't it? It is. (laughs) I I think it's because those TV shows were probably on around this time and like they thought, you know, this makes it look futuristic, let's design it to look like that. But do you ever remember watching, um, oh, this would be a TV show I used to watch, the Time Tunnel, it was called. It used to be on Channel 4. I think they showed it in the 90s. It's a repeat of an old 60s show. Oh, I don't remember that. And yeah. it was like Erwin Allen who did like Lost in Space and Land of the Giants, all those kind of cheesy 60s sci-fi uh, series. But they'd always have in the background loads of these kind of terminals and, you know, like reel-to-reel tapes going. Yeah, I even <laughs> remember on Red Dwarf, they used to just get loads of old bits. And uh, even on the IT crowd, actually, they had a, a recent call-out where they were saying to people, Oh, can you get stuff for the last series? And I think they had an Altair. Oh, an Altair, yeah, 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 they did, yeah. And Commodore Pet was there as well. But I remember that in these old, like, sci-fi shows, all these machines, whenever there was, like, a crash or an error, they'd all just stop blowing up and sparks would come out (laughs) and stuff. It's like... Just pyros going off. Not the best design. But, I mean, yeah, there is something very sci-fi and kind of retro-futuristic, if that's a phrase. Yeah, kind of Metropolis style. You know, this is uh, some really nice pictures, so I recommend just looking at this link because our description doesn't give it justice. I mean, looking at these old mainframes as well, have you ever seen like a cray machine? Yeah, yeah. And Gorgeous. Uh, I've, I, yeah, I've just walked around and, you know, my dad said, oh, I used to work on one of those old ones and it looks like a sexy washing machine or yeah. something. You know, there's <laughs> loads of uh, really nice old designs. But I mean, I think that's kind of missing from computers these days, isn't it? I mean, obviously there was all the uh, the silicon graphics machines. They always looked awesome, didn't they? Oh, that was it. There was all these innovative designs and the consoles would always kind of be a little bit different shaped, mm-hmm. but it was usually a box. But I think it was in the 90s when those horrible beige PC towers yeah. came in and that just destroyed everything. I know people put lights in them and stuff, but it's not the same as <laughs> big classic knobs that you can turn and switches, you know. Yeah, your, uh, your boy racer LED lighting's not quite up there with it, is it? No, not at all. <laughs> now, uh, speaking of retro technology that's uh, kind of had a reinterpretation for the modern day, um, a guy's making his own VHS artwork. Yeah, and this is uh, really cool because he's kind of getting the modern film. So he's got like Deadpool, mm-hmm. uh, The Revenant, uh, The Force Awakens, and he's made his own VHS covers. But he's also you know, faded them a bit and made them look genuine. <laughs> yeah, they look like they could be 30 years old, like straight out your attic, don't they? Now, this is a guy on Instagram. His uh, account name is Off Track Outlet. And he's done just that. It's modern movies that are like literally stuff that's been in the cinema over the last couple of years. And he's actually, these look awesome. I don't know, I don't know how he's done this, but they look like they could have been like legit VHS video covers. Yeah, and uh, he's, he's chose some quite funny covers as well. If if you go down to the bottom and you look at the Deadpool one, it's really not like how Deadpool's advertised at the moment. It kind of looks like a nineties um, cheesy movie. If it had come out back then, yeah, yeah, it's even got like yeah, the video screen logo at the top as well, and like a price sticker over the top. Oh yeah, really, really well done. The detail, you know, he's uh, 
he's done it very accurately. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, it says at the top of this article, people have brought back the vinyl record. Why not the VHS tape? <laughs> yeah. Or HD VHS. Now, Ravi. Yes. How well do you think you know your games and technology and stuff like that? Oh, God. Um, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> this is it. I'm good when we've got show notes. <laughs> okay. Well, there is something I've been looking at on a website called uh, shortlist.com, and it is a retro gaming quiz. Are we going to do this? Well, I haven't, I haven't given you any of these questions in advance or anything no, like no, that. No, no, I so haven't seen them. little disclaimer out there. So I'm going to make a fool out of myself. We'll see. I've got some appropriate music. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. So uh, should we start with some of these questions? I thought it might be quite good to uh, test your knowledge. Yeah, sure. Okay, so question number one, and feel free to play along at home here. Violet Berlin was one of the presenters of which video games TV show in the 90s? It's multiple choice. Would you like the choices or do you know? Uh, we'd like the choices for the listeners, please. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Is it A, Bad Influence, B, Bits, or C, Games Master? She would have been good on Bits, but it was Bad Influence, A. Ding! I haven't got a correct sound effect, so we'll have to do that. Okay, question number two. Do you like this? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's, it's like a millionaire, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> what car... Do you drive in the original Outrun Arcade game? Is it A, a Ferrari Dino, B, a Porsche 911, or C, a Ferrari Testarossa? I think it's Porsche 911. <laughs> Ferrari Testarossa, <laughs> incorrect. God, <I'm> sorry. <laughs> Name the first level in the initial Sonic the Hedgehog game. A, Green Hill Zone, B, Mushroom Kingdom, or C, Miracle World? It's got to be the Green Hill Zone. Ding! <laughs> <laughs> Which knighted inventor created the ZX80, ZX81, and ZX Spectrum? Tim Berners-Lee, Alan Sugar, or Clive Sinclair? Sir Clive Sinclair. What was the name of the anthropomorphic egg hero of Codemasters' wildly popular 8-bit platform games? Is it A, Chucky Egg, B, Dizzy, or C, Horace? I would say it is Dizzy Egg. <laughs> Last week, uh, we had the Oliver Twins on. If you'd have got that one wrong, I'd have never yeah. looked at that down. <laughs> you won't be coming back on the podcast, Rob. Right, should we do one more question? Yeah. Okay. The pressure's on now. <laughs> the heartbeat gets involved. <laughs> yeah. On which island did Guybrush Threepwood find himself in the 90s? A, Yoshi Island, B, Monkey Island, or C, Angel Island. Monkey Island. Of course it was. You did actually pretty good. You got one wrong, man. Congratulations. So if you want to check out this full quiz... Have a go yourself. Yeah, yeah. test your mates. <laughs> we'll pop a link in the show notes. You can wipe the sweat from your brow now. Yeah, God. Right, Relief. next one. Speaking of getting nervous, actually, a Super Mario Maker marriage proposal. Yeah, we saw a little video on this uh, earlier. So the guy's kind of got his future wife in front of him <laughs> and he's like oh just play this level on mario it's fine you can do it you know actually sent me this link my fiance now bear in mind you've already proposed and i took her to paris to do it yeah she sent me this going oh this is amazing and Dude, i'm like you could have just made a worms level or something <laughs> right? exactly i was like what spend so, the money on amigas <laughs> if you haven't seen this video it is a uh, super mario maker on the wii u which if you haven't played it really good game actually you get to make your own mario levels you know you can pick all the different eras of Mario and stuff. It's a pretty cool game. And this guy, to be fair, he's gone to a lot of effort. She starts playing this level. His girlfriend's just sitting there uh, playing this game. She goes along a little bit, jumps over a few platforms and stuff. And then he's actually written it in like blocks right at the top of the screen. Will you marry me? Yeah. And he's like saying to her like, you know, what, what's that say there? Will, will you? Like that. And then it eventually twigs and she's, oh my God, oh my God. Like <laughs> that. So very sweet way of doing it. Obviously a lot of effort went into that, but. Yeah, we also have a, a... A sweet marriage proposal from our guest coming up as well. So we we're do. We're going to talk about that later. He's not the first guy to do this kind of thing, is he? No. It happened uh, a few years before as well. But um, so yeah, for you know, any of you guys are thinking to propose into your other halves, then uh, might be a way to do it. Yep. Uh, yeah. I mean, my missus says she would have liked it, but I'm not sure whether she really would. She'd be like, Dan, why are you playing this game? <laughs> yeah, she wouldn't get that far in the game. <laughs> no. I had to put it right at the beginning. I've seen her play Mario. Yeah, sorry, Samantha, for that impression. <laughs> Don't kill me. <laughs> Right then, so uh, Atari Jaguar news now. Oh, the Jag. Now, a classic shooter is coming out on the Jag. Xenon 2, Mega oh, Blast. Really? Now, apparently this has got the full blessing of Mike Montgomery. 
Okay, that's great. He's well behind it. Now, this is actually a thread on uh, Atari Age. Uh, obviously, you know, us being uh, old Commodore boys, we know the game from the Amiga. Um, this has been an Atari forum. The classic Atari ST game is being ported over to the uh, Jaguar ah, title okay. it. So, yeah. But yeah, it's um, a guy off the, off the forum, actually. Um, Kirano Jones, his name is. And what they're going to be doing is uh, porting this. They're taking pre-orders for it now. So they've got the old carts as well, then. They're actually going to be... Wow. Yeah, releasing this on carts with the, you know, nicely printed labels. It looks like a commercial release. Even better, they've actually um, got a new soundtrack for the game as well uh, by a team called 505. have updated the old Xenon 2 music for it. Oh, wow. I hope they release that separately. Oh, mate. Or I have to come around and (laughs) rip it off your Jaguar. (laughs) Well, yeah, it looks awesome. I mean, if you look at the screenshots here on Atari Age, it is, you know, a proper boxed copy of the game. Yeah, it's only... Fifty-five pounds with postage and packaging, which is like probably cheaper than a lot of Jag games. Oh, dude, yeah, but you know, <laughs> I I wouldn't say I'm a collector as such, but I do kind of buy Jag games as and when they come up. But I mean, you know, fifty-five quid. You know, when the Jag was new, games cost about that anyway. Yeah. So you know, especially in like today, well, probably more in today's money to be fair. And you get it in a nice brand new box, an A3 poster with it as well, properly printed labels. It looks like a commercial release. And uh, if you want to get a copy of it, all you have to do is email the guy and he'll put you on the on the uh, the pre-orders list. Pay your money and you'll get it in the post. Excellent. Great so news. There you go. It's nice to get somebody, because the Jag's actually quite big for homebrew these days. And I guess because of the processor power, they can make it better. Yeah. Well, and they, they, you know, they can make it run smoother. And well, I think, you know, we've, it. we've talked about it in the show before that often these consoles at the time didn't really get the, the kind of love that they deserved really because the devs were, you know, they were only on sale for a couple of years. Yeah. And now, all these years later... All these passionate guys are, you know, fixing them up. Well, they're learning how to use all the chips and stuff that no one knew how to use when it came out, you know what I mean? Well, one thing I'm very happy about is the next news article. Now, you being an Amiga CD32 boy... Oh, yes, this is a Walker has been released for the CD32 on another one of these compilations that they're making at the moment, kind of revamping it. There's a lot of these going around recently, isn't there? A few guys that are doing these updates of um, classic Amiga games and putting them on the CD32, but... Again, you know, like I said about the Jag stuff then, they're putting a load of effort in and doing these properly. You can actually download the um, the label for the CD. There's inlay that you can put in like a CD case. It's all nicely... Well, well, this was a very mouse-based game. Mm-hmm. So what they've actually said is it's they've made it controllable with a D-pad and the forward and backward buttons to move the walker. Oh, right, okay. But the cursor will actually slow down and speed up depending... On you know the kind of accuracy and if you're not firing or not, so you still can get that lock on and that kind of precision with it. And this is a real thought and effort that's gone into Dude, yeah. bringing the title. They haven't just know. slapped like the floppy disk version on a CD and been like, "That's it." You know? Yeah, I mean? no, it's... plug your mouse in. You know, they've they've put controller support in. And this game, of course, was the one that inspired Lemmings. Yeah, well, it, so. it was a Cygnosis game, wasn't it? Like yeah. uh, one of theirs. And well, well, the Walker inspired Lemmings just came afterwards, but it was, you know, ba- all all the same family. But I remember, um, I remember getting a demo of this game on CU Amiga, I think, and it was it, one of the first games I'd ever played where you had dual controls. Yeah. Like you said, then you used, um, was it a joystick to move the Walker and the mouse to shoot? Yeah. Actually, well, it's actually that. keyboard and the mouse. Yeah, crazy though, isn't it? That you know they can actually they've gone to the effort of modifying the code that it works on like a single control pad. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, really cool. I'm so, looking forward to playing this one. Absolutely, and it's a free download as well, so yeah. you can play it on uh, your Amiga CD32 or, or an emulator. And uh, we'll pop a link in the show notes at theretrohour.com. I mentioned in the Amiga, uh, it's quite an interesting little list you found from Red Bull. Yeah, Red Bull. I was like, what Red Bull? The energy writing drink. About, yeah, right about the Amiga, but. Apparently they have a website and it has news on it. I don't know how much I'd trust that. But uh, it's a nice little article here, Mm -hmm. you know, because they talk about who created the Amiga, the rivalry, the strange controllers even. They go quite into depth with the joy board and, you know, Microsoft working for Amiga. But why do you think this has come about? Do you think it's because of the bedrooms to billions exposure, maybe? Well, it says here it's 20 things you probably never knew about the Amiga. Um, it was actually released on 23rd of July 2015, so it looks like it was around the, the 30th anniversary of the Amiga. You know, and a few websites did kind of jump on it, but um, it is cool to see that, because I remember at the time, like, The Guardian did, like, an article about the Amiga, um, yeah. and it's celebrating its 30th birthday. I've not actually seen this article until you sent it to me, though. So it uh, wasn't one that got shared everywhere. No, so it's, it's, still... it's by guy Chris... Chris Scullion, who says, uh, share your memories of Amiga with him. And uh, it looks like he's a writer from Scotland. Okay. So he's probably submitted this news and then 
they've obviously seen Amiga stuff in the news and thought, let's go with it. Well, this guy, he's obviously done his research as well. Um, <laughs> I love this number 10 here. Amiga created disco. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was it. You know, Calvin Harris uh, yeah. created his first album. And I've just done a little video, actually, because I keep saying this, Kanye West and Calvin Harris, you know, are Amiga fans. Mm -hmm. No one believes me. So I've put a video on YouTube and you can see them talking about it themselves. Well, I'd heard um, Calvin talking about that before. I, I mentioned you sent me a video of um, Zane Lowe off Radio 1 talking yeah. to Kanye. And he briefly mentioned the Amiga on the end of that, but I'd never seen this video that you've Yeah, I've, I've literally spent days searching all the early interviews just to see if anyone mentioned it. Should we play a little bit of it? Yeah, let's go for it. Once I was like in seventh grade, I was like really into drawing and I wanted to like design video games. So I got this Amiga computer, that, which is a really good price for all that it did. It was um, $500 and it had like all type of graphic program and everything. D-Paint probably. Computer, yeah. and I was trying to draw on it. Then <laughs> I got a sound program, like somebody bootlegged a copy of the disc for me the sound program. I found myself just wanting to work on that all the time. Then I found myself... That's like, pretty awesome, though, isn't it? Yeah, and he was even playing crack games. <laughs> and, uh, copy well, discs, didn't he get yeah. busted recently? And, like, um, he posted like something on Twitter and had a screen grab of like him torrenting someone else's like, yeah, music program. Yeah. Logic or something, and like, whoever it was went absolutely ape at him on Twitter. So, uh, yeah, he's still keeping the scene alive. Yeah, but uh, I'm just kind of pulling out this information and trying to keep Amiga relevant, you know. That is really awesome, that, though, because, I mean, like I mentioned, I, I'd heard about um, Calvin Harris, but, yeah, Kanye West, I had no idea I ever made music on the Amiga. And you yeah. mentioned the Prince did as well, Bars Prince and Pipes. Prince did, yeah, Bars and Pipes, uh, BB King. Um, there, was, there was quite a lot of musicians, actually. So if you want to check out Ravi's video, and also we'll post a link to this uh, 20 Things You Probably Never Knew about the Commodore Amiga, although I think we did actually know most of them, yep. but, yeah, not everyone does. Just because we're... Geeks. <laughs> now, uh, some Steven Spielberg news. Yes, this is a thing that we keep mentioning because this is going to be such a good film. Well, I'm hoping Ready Player One, which is coming up now. The writer of Ready Player One, Ernest Klein, has actually invited people to submit their own designs of avatars and they can appear in the film in the background, graffitied on the wall and stuff. That is awesome, isn't it? It's really good. And this, this film's going to be absolutely massive, I no, I go on about it a lot, but mm. it's one of my favourite books. It's just great that, you know, obviously the Console Wars movies been in production soon, hopefully, as well. The fact that we're getting like, Hollywood films made about our industry is... Totally, and this one is going to totally hook into it because it hooks virtual reality and retro gaming together. And those are the two kind of different ends of the spectrum. And it, you know, brings it together for today's millennials. So... What's just crazy is, if you'd have told me when I was a kid you've got a chance to be in a Steven Spielberg movie. You'd be like, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, just submit a picture and it can be in a Steven Spielberg movie. <laughs> it's unheard of, but it's a good piece of interactivity there with the film. Well, uh, the website that you've got to go to is uh, the Talent House website, which is where you can submit your design, which is uh, talenthouse.com. Apparently it's going to be a three, 3D avatar, they're saying. I don't know, of course the movie's probably going to be made in 3D or, you know, they're doing some virtual reality kind of... The film oh, yeah, yeah, the, well. whole, the whole concept of the film is that they're in a kind of virtual world. So yeah. there'll be a lot of 3D, but graffiti makes me think it will probably be in the real world section of it. So yeah, you yeah. never know. On a wall or something. Yeah, yeah so I'm... Read the book, it's amazing. <laughs> I might try and draw one in Microsoft Paint and uh, you know, see if they accept that. Or you fake know. 3D. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, put some like perspective on the background, draw lines <laughs> going back. <laughs> now, before we get to our chat this week with um, Barry Leach, this just blew my mind when you showed me this video. It's a thing called Slow Scan TV. Essentially, this guy is receiving pictures on his laptop from the International Space Station. Yeah, well, this goes back to kind of 1957 and 58 when mm -hmm. SSTV was Slow Scan TV, was uh, uh, main, mainly used by amateur radio operators. So they'd send static pictures over the radio frequencies. They'd be sending the data. Now, uh, this happened before when we talked about teletype mm -hmm. and how people were sending ASCII pictures. This is full kind of pictures that they were sending over the airwaves. So that was pretty amazing. You know, in the 1970s, they could send images. And it was used in early space exploration. So that was how they would communicate from the moon landing mm -hmm. was with slow scan TV. You know, the, pi the, images the pictures out. of them walking and Neil Armstrong's first... Yeah, La landing on the moon. We've all seen the pictures, but yeah, I never knew how they transmitted them. Yeah, you, you think, think how it? did they transmit it? They just did it total long wave radio, yeah. wouldn't it be? It wasn't from, a JPEG. Yeah, no. <laughs> but the but the interesting thing is that 
that the International Space Station is still transmitting slow scan TV. So you can go and get a aerial, mm -hmm. stick it in a car park. There's all these videos of guys in America in certain good locations for it. A bit of PC software on Windows, and you can actually receive historical documents, uh, you know, newspaper clippings, but being transmitted from the uh, space station. That is so cool. It is really cool. E even the sounds as well. <laughs> how yeah. awesome is that? <laughs> that is really cool. And you, you often wonder how these things in space work and how, like, do you know how they measure the distance between the moon and the Earth? No. they got a tiny mirror. Oh, really? So they put a mirror on the moon when they landed there and then they fire a laser from the Earth and it hits the mirror <laughs> and then bounces back and then they can tell the distance and if it's moving. Or... <laughs> I'm going to do a space podcast, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. We'll find that mirror and buy some stuff off it. But this, I've always kind of wanted to do stuff like this. I remember when I was a kid, um, reading through, there was like, I think it was in like a Sunday newspaper. There was a supplement in there and it had a bit about computers in. Yeah. And I remember them showing like people that had their own kind of weather stations. And I think they were using stuff like Commodore 64s and there was like pictures of like you could get the weather map on your screen by using a satellite receiver and stuff like that. So I've always wanted to do something like that because it just looks yeah, so kind cool. Of, I love this concept of sending data and information through the airwaves. Mm -hmm. Like recently they have uh, ham repeaters, which is ham radios, are actually sending out the uh, signal from the internet right, uh, to ham radio receivers. So guys are in the middle of the desert tuning into long wave and receiving internet signals is <laughs> going on Google. It's crazy. Man, well, I, you know, they used to do stuff like broadcast, um, like uh, like computer programs and that over TV channels at night, I remember. Yeah, and stuff yeah. Like that. And they, you could record them. Yeah. And there is loads of videos of other guys doing this kind of thing and receiving them and showing you how to get the perfect image and all that. You know what, though, I'd be thinking aliens. Aliens, yeah. yeah, yeah they're going to they're gonna start <laughs> receiving. They'll be like... All these old text documents. They've just landed on the moon. <laughs> oh, my God. There's a movie in this, isn't yeah. there? There is, absolutely. <laughs> totally. So, uh, yeah, if you want to find out more about this, they call it um, ISS SSTV Reception. Uh, plenty of videos on YouTube. I'd not heard of this before, but I think this is dead cool. You know, I've always been a bit of a space geek ever since I was a kid. Yeah, I kind of wondered how they did it, and I asked my dad, and he said... Look up SSTV. <laughs> Always trusty dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we will pop these videos in the show notes at theretrohour.com. And thank you for checking out episode number 23. We'll be back again next Friday, as always. Get the show from theretrohour.com, uh, SoundCloud, MixCloud, iTunes, YouTube, all the usual places. And for the next half an hour on the Retro Hour, this is going to be an interesting one. We have Barry Leach. The guy that Rihanna, she wants his tunes. <laughs> Absolutely amazing composer for the Amiga, for all kinds of system. This guy knows sound chips in and out. And it's great. It's epic music. So for the next half an hour on the Retro Hour, here he is, Barry Leach. And we'll see you next Friday. See you next Friday. Good then, Barry. So, what was your first computer experience? First computer experience, probably when one of my buddies got a ZX81. I think, I think we spent the whole summer uh, just finding out how it worked, you know, typing in programs and stuff. What kind of stuff did you do on the ZX81 then, mainly? <laughs> Not a lot, with only one kilobyte. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you weren't making music on that machine, were you? No, no, I think we learned how to program basic. We tried making our own games and stuff. Just that, I mean, that euphoric feeling of being able to make something move on the TV that was under your control, I mean, that was, that was mind-blowing at the time. I think I got a Spectrum the year after that and then managed to trade up for a Commodore 64 about 18 months later. Was that always a machine that you wanted then, the C64? Oh, yeah. I mean, after you heard the music on it, hell, Ghostbusters. <laughs> One of my buddies called me up and played that over the phone and I was like, holy Christ, that's awesome. That's... Could you play any instruments before or, or did you just jump into the music on the C64? Uh, I could play the recorder. <laughs> and I, I can still play the uh, the piano at a very rudimentary level. So I, I, I really couldn't play any instruments properly. I just learned how to program it all on the computer. That was the exciting th part. So what got you into doing computer music? Um, I think we'd heard uh, Rob Hubbard's demos on the Commodore 64. I mean, I'd always been interested in do, putting music on the computer. I'd, I'd borrowed a friend's BBC Model B over a summer holidays and I... I think I spent five days uh, transcribing back staccata and D minor into this uh, music program they had on it called the Music System. I mean, that was a labor of love, but at the end of it, you got to hear the, the full piece of music, which 
up until then, you had to go out and buy a record or a uh, cassette of it to hear it. Was that playing out the BBC's uh, internal speaker as well, was it? Oh, yeah, yeah, completely. You'd be all excited going and getting your friends and making them come listen to it, and they'd be like, Jesus, what's this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was an acquired taste, wasn't it, the BBC sound chip? <laughs> oh, yeah, completely. But it, it, it led on to the, to the Commodore 64, and then it was, it was like, wow, this is one step closer to realism. So what was your first uh, production on the Commodore 64 then? The first one I got paid for, uh, that would have been Ickups. And I was 15 and a half, just turning, just about to turn 16 when, uh, when I got the phone call from uh, Firebird Software. It was Colin Fuge or Fuig, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Uh, but he called me up. I, I had sent every game company in Britain a, a demo disc of music and I'd called them all up, pestering them, saying, hey, you guys should buy my music. I mean, I was an obnoxious little 15-year-old. And finally, he gave in. He said, you know what? I like this tune. I want to buy it. I want to put it in a game. Yes. And that's how it all started. And how much did you get paid? I'd like to say it was millions, but it was £150. <laughs> Not bad for a 15-year-old, though, is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, remember that I, I, I told you that I'd called every single game company in Britain. Mm -hmm. Well, the phone bill was £300 for that quarter. <laughs> my, my dad did his nut. He took the cheque right from me. Oh, <laughs> oh, man. Oh, oh. So um, what did you find so special about the SID chip? It was... People were finding new ways to, to make things sound more realistic or to sound unique. I mean, those uh, arpeggio sounds that Rob and Martin both used and Ben as well. I mean, even Fred Gray, he was creating his own unique sounds. I mean, it was all down to your music driver at the time. And that's, I mean, these, these guys had a great advantage over everybody else because they wrote their own music drivers. I mean, there, there was a constant one-upmanship going on. I mean, the, the, the same way, I mean, we would go to the computer club every week uh, just to swap games and or music and graphics and stuff. And you, you would see what other people were doing in demos and we would try and do the same or do better. I don't know. It was just that constant one-upmanship. Everybody trying to see what the next thing they could do was. We've had a, was, a few guys on from the demo scene before, and that was, you know, it, it was quite a, a un unique thing really to the Commodore machines, wasn't it? Like the 64 and the Amiga. Do, do you think a lot of creativity was kind of founded there? Yeah, because a lot of people, I mean, people kept finding, you know, you, you, you would have a scrolling message one week and then next week someone had a scrolling message in the border where it was impossible to do that. And, then somebody was getting digital drums in their tunes, and sampled drums and stuff. It was just, it was incredible that they kept managing to squeeze more and more out of the hardware. It's a kind of competition fueling the creativity. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, they still are today as well. I mean, you look at some of the new Commodore 64 demos and you're like, how on earth did they do that? <laughs> yeah, I know, it's just ridiculous now. I've seen some of them. It's like, yeah, give it up, guys, come on. <laughs> it's still massive, though, isn't it? All over Europe, it's like, you know, people are still making these demos 30 That's years crazy. later. <laughs> so what would you say was your all-time favourite sound chip then? I got to say the Amiga right. because it totally levelled the playing field for everybody. It wasn't down to your music driver then. Everybody just had four channels and samples and have at it you know you could do anything anything you could have done on the commodore 64 or bbc or any of the other computers you could emulate with the four channel samples yeah because i heard you were doing your game boy uh, no game gear tracks using pro tracker and then converting it yeah i used to type everything into hex and then we had this wonderful unified data structure that meant we could uh, convert to different platforms really quickly do you remember the first time you saw an Amiga? Uh, yeah, I was probably down in Portsmouth. Uh, I was working for a company called Catalyst Coders, which was a little two-bit outfit that uh, was trying desperately to survive making games. And uh, they had some Amigas, and I managed to get hold of one of the, I think it was an Amiga 1000. I don't know, started, I got a copy of Pro Tracker and I was creating music. I thought it was awesome. Well, there's one of your games that actually um, sold an Amiga to one of my friends. Um, he, oh, yeah? yeah, he had a PC and then he heard the, uh, the music to Lotus 2 and his jaw just dropped. <laughs> and then he begged his mum and dad awesome. for one. <laughs> so at the time, I think he had like an Amstrad PC and it was obviously you know, the internal speaker he had on it. And he couldn't believe that music was coming out of a computer. That's crazy. <laughs> That's excellent. So tell us about the Lotus games then, when you, when you got to work on those. How did that come about? Uh, well, I was working for Imagitech and uh, one of the bosses from Imagitech had gone to work at Gremlin. So we had a pretty close relationship because we would convert games for them. And Imagitech were primarily a conversion house. You know, if, if someone had an arcade game and they wanted it put across five formats, 
they'd contract him. I just take to do it. So we were doing some work for Gremlin, and then uh, Ben Dogleish had left Gremlin, and they needed someone to do their audio. So whenever that came up, they would generally just phone up Imagitech and say, hey, can you get Barry to knock out a few tunes for this project or that project? And that was how Lotus came around and Utopia and Harlequin. Well, uh, a very popular tune at the time was Oh Yeah by Yellow. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it sounded very similar. <laughs> was that a conscious thing? Well, at the time we just had got, a, I think we'd just got our first sampler or CD drive and we had managed to, you know, it was like, oh my God, I can finally get samples at last because up, up until that point, we were we were really poor. We had no money as a development company, and so uh, we didn't af- we couldn't afford samplers or synthesizers or instruments or even speakers for the office. Christ, it was crazy. So I think finally we'd got a CD, and we managed. I'd, I got everybody in the office to bring in their CDs so I could uh, try and rip little bits of the instrument samples out of them. You know, like uh, oh yeah. Where it has the chick chicka hi hats and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I was uh, I was cutting little bits of samples out of every CD that I could because up until then I'd been stuck ripping them out of other people's modules. And the idea for that tune came to me in a dream. I, I was I think I went home one day and thinking, okay, I've got to write some music for a driving game tomorrow, so I'll try and think of something. And of course, I go to sleep thinking about it, and during the night I have a, this dream of what kind of tune I should write for it, and I wake up the next day and I go into the office and just write it, and within a couple of hours it was finished. Well, there was even, um, I know one thing that a lot of people mentioned about that track is, there's actually a hidden message uh, saying, do not copy this game <laughs> in the Lotus 2 mod. Is that something you put in there? Maybe. you got to remember too, not only were we very poor, we were very young and very irresponsible, and uh, I don't know, we were screwing around at the time. We were kind of annoyed and frustrated with our situation situation because you got to think I mean we're we're busting our ass on these projects and not exactly reaping the rewards from it so we were screwing around thinking hey we should put some subliminal speech in we should have something like you must kill mummy and daddy <laughs> oh, no, no that would be really bad we shouldn't do that because what if somebody actually does it I well, thought well we'll try we'll, we'll, we'll put in something like you will not copy this game did it work uh, I, I believe the the cracked version was done by a French group so uh, it could be the proofs in the pudding if they didn't speak English <laughs> That's it. Well, a lot of your tunes had this kind of great slack bassy bass line vibe, and that I think was a, a running theme throughout the Amiga. Uh, what samples did you use for those? Anybody else's that were any good? The 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 demo scene. I mean, they they would always inspire us because they were doing these fantastic demo tunes that were. I mean, sometimes they were huge. They were like five hundred you know, five hundred kilobytes, which was the entire Amiga memory, and so we'd be like. God, I mean, these we have to try and create something that's comparable to these demo tunes that are being done without using 500k, obviously, because there'd be no room for the game. So, I mean, those guys were really raising the bar, and the only way to keep up for us was to try and find some samples and put them all together and write a tune that competed with them or sounded good enough. So now originally everyone kind of used those like ST01 and ST, you know, the, the soundtrack of discs at first, didn't they? And a lot of Amiga songs yeah. would sound the same for a bit. Oh yeah. I mean, I think I was up to ST75 by the time I finished because <laughs> they all had to be labeled like that. The, the ST and then the number of the disc. So well, uh, uh, I was creating my own discs full of samples from other demos and eventually when we got a sampler it was we'd record sounds in the office or, but we still never had any synthesizers at least not at Magitech. Well another tune that you did uh, was Lethal Weapon uh, the title music for that have you heard of the uh, Rihanna controversy? Yeah yeah uh, I saw that that's uh, it's quite controversial that and he's got a history of doing that stuff too ripping old Commodore 64 music Timbaland isn't it? Yeah, have you heard the comparison uh, yeah. uh, between it? Yeah, it's very close, isn't it? <laughs> Almost identical. It would be nice if he would give the people credit. And some royalties or publishing would be nice. But And you're in a video game yourself. Oh, which one? The uh, Pirates of Voodoo Island? Yeah, <laughs> that's the one. <laughs> okay, so there's a voice actress that I work with fairly often. And she's extremely talented. Her name's Lonnie Manella. She's been in thousands of video games. She's incredible voice talent. Every now and again, she gets a request for someone to do a Scottish accent. And so she called me up and she says, hey, and I know you don't usually do acting and stuff, but we're having trouble finding someone that can do a good Scottish accent. Any chance you want to audition for it? I'm like, well, not really, but seeing as it's you, oh, your favor, I'll do it, whatever. So I, I do an audition. And I'm not trying to get the part. I don't really want the part. 
And of course, they cast me for the main part, <laughs> which is like two days worth of recording. I got kind of lucky because they were quite happy just with my natural voice. They thought it suited the character of a little short, fat Scottish pirate. So it wasn't a million miles away from uh, <laughs> from reality. <laughs> How did you find the process of doing uh, acting in like voiceovers then? It, it's actually quite draining. It, it's surprisingly draining. Uh, just being on your feet, putting that emotion into every line that you have to speak and stuff. And of course, you've got your voice director in your ear the whole time screaming at you, telling you, no, no, make it more dramatic. Put more passion into it. Christ, I thought I just did. I'm tired. <laughs> I want a drink. Getting back to your music after the Amiga days and, um, you know, sampling kind of turned into CD soundtracks and you had a lot more room with like the 32-bit generation that came along. Did you kind of find there was a, a massive change around then? Yeah. I mean, when, when I was at Ocean, uh, that was when we first got to do... Uh, our first all CD soundtrack. Uh, in fact, there was a couple. There was one for the CD32 version of Sleepwalker, but the other one, the big one, was uh, a game called Epic. Do you remember that? Yes, Did you yes. ever see that? They were going to do a CD-ROM version of that. It was the precursor to TFX and Infernal. But uh, me, Dean Evans, and Keith Tinman, we all uh, we all went at this with everything we had, trying to wanted it. I mean that. This was our coming of age project, you know, finally we get to write real music with real synthesizers. And of course, Ocean only had like four synthesizers between three of us. So there was constant stealing synthesizers from each other's offices and fights over it and stuff. Well, what was the atmosphere like at Ocean back in those days? It must have been a pretty exciting place to be. It was really cool. I mean, I, I got to join Ocean just uh, just before they left the catacombs and moved into the Castlefield offices. So I, I actually got to sit in the crypt where Martin Galway had worked years before, which was, uh, I thought that was really cool because I'd, I'd started uh, talking to Martin when I was, you know, 15, 16 years old. And here I was like three or four, five years later, actually getting to work where he'd worked. And so there's a bit of a fanboy thing going on there. But uh, Ocean really had their shit together compared to other development houses that I'd worked at or seen, you know. I mean, when I was at Imagitech, we thought Gremlin was amazing because they had enough chairs for everybody and they actually had enough computers and stuff. <laughs> and then when you go to Ocean, it's, it was amazing. The offices were all clean and smart and they had keyboard synthesizers. We even had a network. We, we were the first part of the company to have a network, the audio guys. We had all our computers networked up so we could move sounds around and stuff. After being there for like, two or three weeks, I think. Um, they'd had some trouble with staff getting poached. So Gary Bracey basically went round the company and gave everybody like a five grand pay rise. Wow. Which was like, holy cow, this is amazing. It's like I've died and gone to heaven. Well, obviously Ocean were kind of famed for doing all the film licenses. I mean, was it kind of, it, it all seemed to me as a kid when I used to read about Ocean Software that money must have just flowed through those those doors because of all these massive like million pound franchises that they're signing up. Was it quite quite a glamorous place to be? Yeah. I think it was. I mean, to me, it was. I mean, I have no idea how much money went through that place. I imagine it was quite a lot. Well, you you seem to be the kind of main guy for speed or driving game music, uh, <laughs> with Top Gear being one of your big titles. And uh, I think there's like 13 racing games now. Yeah. <laughs> Out of all the racing games I worked on, uh, Top Gear on the Super Nintendo got really popular in Brazil, of all places. <laughs> um, and only in Brazil. I mean... Uh, Americans have heard of Top Gear, but not that many people play it, and they certainly don't remember the music. But I think that the SNES had an extended shelf life in Brazil. I think they played it there quite late, into the late 90s, early 2000s. Maybe it might but, be because of Art and Senna and the uh, you know, racing history in Brazil. Yeah, maybe. I mean, that, that's a, a big thing to consider, too. But uh, yeah, uh, those guys, they, they really like that soundtrack. I mean, if you go on YouTube, there's thousands of Bra uh, videos of Brazilians playing it on guitar and stuff. So just like, uh, like in Europe, if you're learning to play guitar, you'll play Stairway to Heaven. It seems like down in Brazil, they start to play the Top Gear music. <laughs> and it's like, wow, this is it's incredible. It's, it's really flattering. Uh, I know you're based in America these days, but have you seen the... Uh the new series of Top Gear? I might have. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, I, I can't believe the producer didn't tell Chris Evans to shut the hell up, stop shouting. He was echoing around the studio, I think. He was yeah, <laughs> I know. Maybe he was afraid of getting punched or something. I don't know. <laughs> well, Ravi did mention the Rush series on the N64. Um, do you remember when you first uh, kind of got your hands on the N64 dev kit and uh, what, what were your kind of early experiences and impressions of that platform? Well, I'd worked on the N64 up 
in Seattle at Boss Game Studios. I'd worked on Top Gear Rally. Um, there was a couple other titles we were doing. Uh, Spider for this PlayStation Kill Team. Uh, there was a tank game on the Virtual Boy thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I did Top Gear Rally on the N64, uh, which was... We, we, we basically just wrote a mod player for it so I could just write the music on the PC and they could dump the mod straight into the cartridge. And after Boss, I'd gone down to Atari. They got me involved because uh, Rush 1 had only scored like 45% in the reviews for the audio. So they're like, okay, we need to hire someone different here. Let's let's hire this other guy who's done N64 and racing games. So they hired me and I had like six weeks to bang out Rush 2 when I first got there. That whole time, uh, Atari wouldn't pay for uh, hotels for me or moving expenses and stuff. So, so the whole time that I was writing that, I was bouncing around from hotel to hotel every night, trying to find a cheap hotel. Bouncing around, trying to crank out all these drum and bass tunes and try to do something a little different. It, it must have been interesting on the N64 because um, cart-based system, how would transferring the sound be compared to a CD? Well, it, it's all wavetable uh, as opposed to CD based. Um, so you, you only have a, a single sample for your instruments rather than using a synthesizer or uh, you know, a MIDI device of some sorts. And so uh, you got you know one bass sample, one guitar sample, one kick sample, one snare. And I think I used a lot of drum loops to try and uh, beef it up a bit to make it sound like there was a lot more going on. <laughs> kind of sounds like your Amiga dies again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Because, I mean, it's all wavetable. And that's, I mean, I, I still do a lot of that stuff with toys because a lot of it's wavetable, although it's much lower polyphony and lower sample rates and bit rates. Yes. There's a lot of engineering that goes on. So what's this thing about video games live and Top Gear? Ah, the Tommy Tallarico thing, yeah. Uh, because Top Gear was so popular in Brazil, video games live plays all around the world. They've played uh, like 350 concerts or something. They're, they've got a Guinness Book record for this where they play classical versions of old video game music. And every time they go to Brazil, any country, he usually asks the audience, he says, you know, what do you guys want to hear next? Uh, you know, what video games are big? What, what do you want to hear? And every time he goes to Brazil, they always say, Top Gear. That's what we want to hear the orchestra play. So, of course, Tommy's been trying to put this off, and now, after 10 years of going to Brazil, he's finally given in to the Brazilians. And he contacted me and says, hey, you know, we're going to do this. Do you, do you want to get involved? Do you want to start doing the arrangement and stuff? And I said, well, you know, I've not really done a whole lot of full orchestral stuff before. I says, but I'll take a go at it. And so I, I did a, an arrangement, a, a medley. Because I'd already just done the, the whole revisit to Top Gear with Horizon Chase, I thought it would be kind of cool to, to do a medley of the two uh, tunes to mix them together in an orchestral style. And so I put them together and sent them off to Tommy. And Tommy said, you know what, that sounds pretty good. He says, I've got a full orchestrator and he uses these top Hollywood orchestrators and uh, they take they took what I had done and then embellish it make it so it's actually playable by instruments real instruments and stuff and so he's uh, he, he did a big Kickstarter thing uh, for his video games level 5 and he's recording it with an orchestra in Prague in June and he's mixing it at Skywalker Ranch in July oh, wow. and I believe he's going to uh, perform it live for the first time in Brazil in August. That's going to so be it, massive. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, it, it, it's like every composer's dream to get to hear an orchestra play their music. So uh, he, he's invited me out to uh, to Skywalker Ranch in July sometime to to be there on the day that he's mixing it because he's he, he's doing a CD as well as the uh, as well as the concert. It's actually a really clever way to do it, you know, because if he does the CD beforehand, then he has all the arrangements worked out. And S seeing it actually done by an orchestra a track that you made all those years ago, that's going to be insane, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, totally. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited and very touched. I mean, it's, it's totally down to the, the people in Brazil that made this happen. I mean, if it wasn't for them, I'd probably never get to hear it. Have you still got any of your old kit then, like your old uh, Commodore and Amiga stuff, anything like that still? I do have. I've got a couple of boxes of Commodore 64 discs out in the garage. Same with Amiga discs. But other than that, not really. I think I've got a couple of Amigas that people kept giving me. Because Amigas are so rare in America and nobody really knew what to do with them. Mm -hmm. 
So when I showed up and they're like, oh, hey, you worked on an Amiga game. Great. Here, have this. It's been sitting in my garage for years. In America, it was like a video toasting machine. That was it, really, wasn't it? Yeah. And I mean, nobody used it at all. Nobody at all. In fact, uh, when I went to N uh, Nintendo, I, I was at Nintendo in Seattle in 91, I think it was, to make some instrument samples for the Nintendo, uh, for, for, for the SNES. I, I took over a huge box of Amiga samples discs. And I was like, okay, I just want to take all these samples and put them on the Amiga, on the Super Nintendo, because I've got this huge library. And they're like, yeah, we don't have an Amiga. <laughs> it's like, really? The company the size of Nintendo of America, you don't have a single Amiga. It's like, no, nobody has them. And eventually they managed to find someone that had one. But So were you uh, disappointed with the collapse of the Amiga? I thought the Amiga had a very good run. I mean, I think I was a little disappointed that the CD version of it didn't gain more traction. Because I thought there was a lot of mileage there. Because the PC was still just getting to getting up to speed. The, the, the PC at the time, there was two sound cards. There was the Sound Blaster with the FM synthesis and the, the Roland MT32, which had these great uh, synthetic voices. And we were we were the only people in the UK that had uh, had a great music driver for using the MT32. So uh, bet between us and Origin and Sierra. I mean, there was only like three companies in the world that were really creating audio for the sound card, and it was fantastic. I mean, if you get a chance, you should go and look up some old MT32 music, because yeah. for the time, it was just years ahead of, of the competitors. Well, getting away from uh, your career briefly for a second, you had uh, quite an interesting wedding proposal, I saw. Uh, yeah, we <laughs> sneaked it into Horizon Chase. See, we, we used to put little Easter eggs in, like, Rush and rush 2049 and stuff you know you'd put something on the billboard i think if you take a look around you'll find some rather interesting ones for those but uh so 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 i asked the developers i said hey look i'm planning on proposing to my girlfriend uh is there any way we can like slip like a, a billboard at the side of the road somewhere on one of the levels that just says hey karen will you marry me and they said oh hell we can do better than that and so they did this the fantastic thing where you could draw a little love heart and it brings up the proposal and they, they sent a film crew out to Scotland to record her so I could see her reaction, and it was fantastic. <laughs> Did she have any idea you were doing that then? No, she had absolutely no idea. It was great. It worked perfectly. <laughs> you old romantic. <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and I guess she can still load up the game and go, oh, look, this is how he proposed to me. Yep. It was probably the only way I was ever going to get a video game poster hung up in my living room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she can't say no to that now, can she? Exactly. <laughs> well, you did make the move to America. How come you decided to uh, move out there then? Most of the talent from Imagitech all came over here. I think out of 50 people at uh, Imagitech, 28 of them all came to the States. I mean, there was a huge brain drain in the early early 90s where they, they were just hungry for game programmers because it was become, you know, the PC was becoming a viable platform and the consoles were taking off, still going strong. So they hired all the Brits. Do you find it much different out there? I mean, there's a lot of different cultures. I mean, there's no there's no pub culture here uh, as such. I mean, if you, if you go to the bar in the middle of the daytime here, it's probably because you've got a problem. <laughs> oh, we'd be awful in America. Then. <laughs> uh, and and the TV's all pish. It's uh, advertisements every ten seconds, it seems. But you know, the cost of living's a lot less, and tax systems far more forgiving. You, you get a better standard of, of life, I think. I'm in Northwest Ohio in this little town. It's it's really idyllic. It's it's almost like the best America has to offer because there's no crime, there's no drama, no traffic. I've lived in the Bay Area. I've I've spent an hour driving five miles to get home, you know, it's, <laughs> screw that. It's nice not having traffic. Well, you know, now obviously you, you've worked in the industry for many years. I mean, um, retro's kind of come back big style recently. Is it still amazing that people are interested in stuff that you did like 20, 30 years ago? Yeah, but and at the same time, it's nice to see that people are finally accepting the pioneering work that Rob, Martin and Ben did with creating these new ways to play back melody with synthesizers that it's finally come full circle and it's becoming more mainstream i mean things like dubstep certainly helped bridge that gap you've actually done some remixes of your old tracks as well yeah i did uh i mean I've, I've been doing them over the years for the immortal series of cds that's partly just because i mean i i think i wanted to do them rather than let somebody else do them in case they screwed it up but also because it's kind of fun to go back and uh to redo it the way I wanted it to sound. And I did a Utopia one, I think last year. That was kind of fun to do. It's just nice to go back and make them bigger, make them sound like I wanted them to sound. Do you have to be careful with that because it's kind of people's memories as well, isn't it? You've got to kind of 
<laughs> you don't want to mess with them too much, I guess. Yeah, I mean, sometimes some of the pieces, like like Hero Quest, is a good example. Mm-hmm. Um, I tried to do an orchestral version of that, and it just the piece really, for me, fell apart really quickly because it was it was rather weak. I thought compositionally, it was really simple. It was too simple, and I felt like I couldn't do an awful lot with it to make it sound good as an orchestral track. Um, although the Patrick Nevian, uh, the German pianist, he did this amazingly beautiful piano rendition of it where he uh, he totally managed to expand on it and embellish it, make it sound good. Far better than I ever could, that's for sure. Sometimes it's good to get a different person's perspective on it though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And that's what they, we, we did that with the Horizon. We, we did a remix contest for Horizon Chase. Mm-hmm. Uh, where we asked, we, we, we ran a competition and we had like 34 different entries, uh, people doing remixes, and it was superb hearing the, the angles that people would come at it from, you know, different directions, and it, it really was good to hear that. Are you much of a gamer yourself? Oh yeah, I still play games, I mean, I, I, although these days I, I play my train simulator a fair bit, mm-hmm. which is kind of sad. I still play Supreme Commander 2. Uh, or, or Supreme Commander Forged Alliance. I was number one on the planet on that for a while. For uh, the, the Global Universal Destroyer was my official title. Well, Barry, if we want to keep up to date with what you're up to these days, is there anywhere they can visit? Yeah, if you go to my website, barryleach.com, there's links to SoundCloud, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, Google Music, iTunes, all that stuff. All in one easy place. <laughs>